How's it everyone who's watching this? This is my 72nd video on the channel, and today we're going to be continuing character analysis by Willem Reich. In particular, we'll be continuing chapter 4, fittingly titled of the technique of character analysis. Within the specific part we'll be looking at today, he offers a case study of one of his patients in almost excruciating detail, illustrating what character analysis looks like in practice. Without further ado, let's get into it. Starting his case study, Reich gives a brief description of a patient himself. 33 years of age, he isn't really certain if he's sick or not, but simply feels as if he isn't truly enjoying life, and sees undergoing psychoanalysis as better than just doing nothing. An important feature of the patient's case is that he has very little insight when it comes to what is affecting him. If you remember from our last episode, this points to the problem being linked to his character, or to simplify a bit, his personality. Another element, one that Reich being Reich sees as highly important, is that he has a very inhibited sex life, although he appears to be at peace with that fact. Finally, the form in which he communicates and acts, held by our author to be just as important as the material he presents for analysis, is marked by a soft voice, difficulties holding eye contact, and a tendency to become embarrassed. Based on these features, Reich says that he is likely suffering from severe feelings of inferiority. When analysis begins, the patient relates two experiences that he considers to be horrible. These were killing a woman by running her over in his car, and having to perform an emergency surgery on someone who was suffocating during the First World War. Additionally, he describes that he was the second oldest child in his family, with his elder brother being the main focus of his parents' attention. Although Reich sees the content of the material as pointing towards feelings of envy and anger at his sibling, the patient strongly denies ever having such feelings. However, after discussing the death of his mother, who Reich believes to be one of the few people to pay attention to and care about him, the patient explains that he had to live with his brother for around five years. In our author's words, it was not from what he said, but from the way he said it, that his enormous animosity towards the domineering, cold, and unfriendly nature of his brother became evident. This is followed by the patient relating that he has a friend who holds him in very high regard. In a session a few days later, he tells Reich of a dream focused around this friend. In it, they were in a strange city, far from home, with the friend's face being somehow different. Based on the fact that the patient had to leave his hometown for analysis, Reich interprets this change as having the analyst stand in for a friend. If you only looked at the contents of a patient's words, this might seem like the beginning of quite a positive transference. It appears like he's fusing the analyst with someone he's close to and trusts. However, on further inspection, this is anything but the case. Whilst the patient accepts the interpretation of the analyst and friend being one, Reich notices that he has nothing else to add. He simply remains silent or monotonously relates doubts about his ability to be analyzed. At this point, Reich makes a mistake. He explains that the patient has something against him, and that he feels incapable of expressing his hostile emotions to his brother. This all works. The problem comes when Reich links himself to the brother. Although he feels correct in this, he interpreted the resistance too early. It failed to have the desired effect, forcing Reich to wait a number of days to figure out the current meaning of resistance itself when it comes to the patient's demeanor. The result, as he relates, is finding that In addition to the transference of the hatred of the brother, there was a strong defense against a feminine attitude, the dream about the friend. At this point, Reich feels like it's still too early to offer this interpretation. Instead, he simply tells the patient that he seems to be trying to avoid analysis, demonstrated by the form of his words and actions. The patient agrees with this, explaining that he always has been described as rigid, inaccessible, and defensive. By consistently raising the issue, Reich is able to uncover just how repetitive and flat the patient's responses are. Here, he says, 
we get a perfect opportunity for distinguishing between a character analytic approach and an active suggestive approach. In the case of the latter, the analyst would try to urge the patient into an artificially positive transference, coaxing him into producing more material. However, with character analysis, this is not how it plays out. As we've seen in the last couple episodes, positive transference has a tendency to flip into the negative. Instead, the focus is solely on consistently pointing out the formal aspects of a material to break down the resistances embedded into the very ways of acting found in the patient. Returning to the dream, the patient argues against Reich's interpretation that he's holding something against him by stressing the fact that Reich appears as someone close to him. Our author reacts by offering the idea that he's unconsciously resentful that Reich refuses to admire him in the same way as his friend. The response is valuable. He had to admit that he had harbored such thoughts, but had not had the courage to tell me. Subsequently, he told me that he had always merely demanded love. Another fault to the situation is that the patient specifically feels these thoughts directed towards those who he perceives as more masculine than him. Even in his friendship, he feels like he plays what Reich terms the feminine role. However, before he is able to continue with this line of interpretation, Reich fell ill, stopping analysis for two weeks. In the meantime, the patient sent a bottle of cognac. After resuming treatment, he explains to Reich that, during the gap, he was tormented by thoughts that someone close to him would die, such as Reich himself, leading to the gift. The obvious interpretation to make here is that, in a way, the patient has an unconscious death wish directed towards his analyst. Additionally, connecting to his fears of femininity, it seems as if the patient is experiencing latent homosexuality. Whilst Reich takes note of these things, he doesn't reveal them to the patient, seeing it as too early to do so. This was basically the theme for a number of weeks, with Reich unable to firmly grasp the meaning of his patient's behavior as a whole. Nevertheless, four aspects stand out. Firstly, the patient wants recognition and love from those he sees as manlier. Next, his attitude to both Reich and his brother is filled with hate. Thirdly, he is actively warding off the idea of femininity. Lastly, drawing these together, the many complaints he makes about the analysis are linked to him feeling inferior to Reich on account of the same underlying femininity. Focusing on this last element, the analyst comes to a realization that the patient is essentially asserting his power over him through his complaints. They demonstrate Reich's lack of skill or power, mirroring the way the patient tends to do the exact opposite of what his boss asks him to do. As Reich explains, Here then lay his pent-up aggressiveness, the most extreme expression of which, until this point, had been the death wish. But our joy was short-lived, the resistance returned in the same form. Despite this return, the revelation was still valuable. Reich is now able to explore the feminine side of a patient's character more easily, although with the added issue of said femininity being more strongly warded off. Even if he earlier freely disclosed that part of him, he begins refusing to admit it exists at all. Eventually, though, through consistent interpretations, Reich brings the patient to a point where he admits that he and his friend actually do have sex, which makes him feel feminine. Our author's response is that, unconsciously, he sees analysis as a similar situation, avoiding being frank so as not to hurt his pride in his manliness. Although the patient himself refuses this interpretation, he does relate a dream where he is lying on the analyst's couch and is kissed by Reich. Although this again leads to a wave of new resistances, these are analyzed as stemming from childhood experiences of disappointment and cruelty at the hands of his father, brother, and teachers. His own cold attitude is simply a way to protect himself against a world he sees as harsh. After the patient accepts this, analysis goes well for a number of days. 
more and more dreams appear, where he seems to present feelings like love towards Reich, although these are not interpreted because they don't directly deal with the main transference, and the patient doesn't seem ready to grasp their meaning. Additionally, he relates that he used to be quite an aggressive young man, Reich offering the interpretation that his current femininity is a response to make up for his earlier extreme masculinity. However, like seems common in this case, as Reich says, The patient did not react to this disclosure at all. Instead, he sank back into the old resistances. He couldn't manage it. He didn't feel anything. The analysis had no effect on him, etc. Continuing with his consistent interpretations of inferiority, Reich adds a new line of attack, a focus on the relationship between the patient and his brother. Although he relates that his mother always gave a lot of attention to the sibling, who additionally played a much more dominant role, the patient refuses to acknowledge any sense of envy or bottled up hatred against him. Because of how resistant the patient is towards Reich's efforts, he considers him to be trapped in something of a negative transference, something that the patient himself recognizes by describing analysts as those who he sees as brutally masculine. It's with this revelation that Reich is able to break into a wealth of new material. To begin with, the patient remembers that he always detested the way his brother constantly started new relationships and always made a show of them. From Reich's appearance, he connected the two figures together, setting the basis for a negative transference to Bloom. Using this, our author explains to the patient that he condemns him and analysis for the same reasons he condemned his brother. Namely, he resents any situation where he feels impotent or less control than others. Once again, we get back to the idea of a character suffering from inferiority. Eventually, after some other breakthroughs and returns to resistances, the patient declares that he has never trusted a man, nor believes in anything, least of all analysis. For Reich, this is quite a major step forward, as paradoxical as it might sound. It signals that he's essentially scared of having his ideas challenged by the process, something that he actually tells the author a few sessions later. As he pushes and pushes, Reich eventually asks if there's any sense of superiority that comes from the condemnation of the brother. This he readily admitted. Indeed, he went even further. He asserted that he really was superior to all the others who chased after women and who were like animals in their sexuality. Mixed with the fear he seems to experience in relation to Reich, the statement by the patient is interpreted as evidence of him not having come to terms with his sexual difficulties. He's essentially trying to make up for what he sees as so-called feminine failings in himself with ideals. The secret sense of superiority that this gives rise to is what leads him to try to resist analysis. From his neurotic perspective, being cured by someone else would show that he's not capable of doing things himself, and even worse for the early 20th century, would mean becoming feminine in some sense. As he explains, the approach Reich took to reach this point was fundamentally based on the ego and its defenses, which he describes as the hallmarks of character analysis. Summarizing his results, he explains that he found the heart of the neurosis in castration anxiety directed towards the brother on account of his sexual activity, along with the feeling of being overlooked by his mother in favor of that very same sibling. If you remember from earlier, the elements related to the mother came out almost at the very beginning. However, it's only here that they're actually being interpreted in any depth. This underlines one of Reich's most important principles. You can't just analyze things as they occur. Instead, you have to base your actions on the transference situation and the defenses, as well as avoiding trying to influence the patient outside of consistent interpretations. Now, he turns to contrasting character analysis to traditional methods, saying, Right at the beginning, the possibility existed of interpreting both his passive homosexual relationship to his brother 
and the death wish. Pushing these strands of thought would likely have led to supporting material. However, without going through the tedious effort of unraveling character defenses first, no interpretation would have led to change. Instead, the only thing gained would be the intellectual knowledge of some psychic conflict or other, ultimately leading to a chaotic situation that, as Reich himself puts it, would be rich in interpretation, but poor in success. Only one approach could have really worked, the character analytic, at least if the goal was to dynamically change the case. In his own words, Effective analysis requires the use of few, but accurate and consistent interpretations, instead of many unsystematic interpretations which fail to take the dynamic and economic moment into account. If you don't remember from last time, or haven't watched other videos in the series, there are three main aspects of psychoanalytic metapsychology. The topographical, dynamic, and economic. The first simply deals with making unconscious things conscious. The second has to do with psychic forces, resistances, and so on. And the last is concerned with the investment of libido, an energy that flows through psychic functions. Reich consistently critiques analysts who focus on the topographical viewpoint, since, as mentioned here, simply uncovering things without dealing with what made them repress in the first place doesn't do much good. It's better to wait and work out their dynamic position and economic role before taking action. However, this is only one criterion for a successful analysis. You also need to keep the connection between the past cause of neurosis and the present situation constant. This is another reason why a topography-driven approach is often problematic. Material originally surfaces in quite a confused and chaotic way, mixing up time and place. As a result, getting right into it can disconnect the two aspects and lead to a situation more akin to divining and guessing than actually deducing what's happening. Whilst it might seem easier to take a non-character analytic approach to start off with, difficulties soon infest the case and make everything more complicated in the long run. With this, as Reich states, The third criterion is the unraveling of the case, not arbitrarily from any position which happens to be conspicuous and intelligible, but from where the strongest ego resistance is concealed. He continues on to say that this must be followed by a gradual and systematic widening of the original analytic exploration. In the case of our patient here, Reich started with the idea of inferiority and slowly expanded its scope until he worked out its connections with castration anxiety and fears of being considered feminine. The slowly bit is particularly important. The nuclear idea of a so-called feminine relationship with the brother showed up relatively early in treatment, with the patient's account of living with him. However, if our author were to have analyzed that element from the get-go, nothing would have happened. It simply wasn't important to the contemporary situation, nor really to the transference. Appealing now to Freud, Reich explains that it's not difficult to link character analysis to the theory of resistance formation and resolution developed by the father of psychoanalysis. Essentially, as illustrated here, they both see resistances as stemming from an impulse from the id that strolls against another impulse from the ego. The one involves repressed desires trying to get out, whilst the other is the self trying to censor them before they become conscious. Although it might seem possible to interpret either side first, Reich argues that it's safest to start with the ego, since it's closest to consciousness and a person's understanding of themselves. To justify this, he gives the example of a resistance composed of repressed homosexuality on the side of the id and of silence on the side of the ego. Telling the patient that they're gay and have unconscious feelings towards the analyst out of the blue likely won't end well, particularly considering the context of 20th century Vienna. Instead, it's better to approach the silence portion, telling the patient 
that they're resisting analysis for some reason or another. From his perspective, it's possible to almost skip over their id strivings in a sense, simplifying the analyst's job at the beginning of treatment. As he puts it, By using procedure, we simultaneously penetrate the negative transference in which every defense finally ends, and also the character, the armor of the ego. On this element of transference, Reich introduces an interesting idea. Basically, he says that the surface of every resistance, defined as that portion closest to the ego, holds a negative attitude towards the analyst. It doesn't matter if what's coming from the id is based on love or hate. The reason for this lies in the analytic situation itself. The ego essentially projects its defense against the id onto the person of the analyst, with the institution of a basic rule dictating free association being unconsciously registered as an attempt to provoke the dangers posed by repressed desires. Additionally, by focusing on the ego, the character itself comes under fire, since it's what ultimately organizes what defenses look like for the patient. Ending this part of the book is thus that Reich leaves us with an important warning connected to the use of his technique. Character analysis subjects a patient to far more psychic strain. The patient suffers much more than when the character is left out of consideration. With this, we finish another section of Chapter 4 from Character Analysis by Willem Reich. Having explored what the titular method of psychoanalysis looks like in practice, although there are a few more case studies detailed in this book, I think this is the only one we'll look at. Because of how repetitive Reich's writing can get when reciting actual events, this was a bit of an exhausting video to prepare. Nevertheless, I truly hope you enjoyed or learned something, and if you feel I got anything wrong, or wasn't as clear as I could have been, please do feel free to let me know in the comments, so I can do better. Next time, we'll most likely be continuing this book. Until then, bye.